church on fire, can we stand to our feet? Who day? All right, now I just heard you, so I know you're awake. I know you're good. That means you're ready to worship. Amen? Let's put those hands together. Come on. All over this room. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to sing to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're going to lift him up in this place. We love you, Jesus. Come on, we say together. You move the mountains. You move the mountains. Told the winds and waves be still. You cast out demons, yes you did. And bid the empty soul be filled. And now there's breakthrough. And now there's freedom in your name. You gave us power. And the keys to do the same. You hold redemption. Accusers drop their stones. You showed us mercy. We thank you, Lord, with your mighty miracles. And now there's breakthrough. Now there's freedom. Now there's freedom in your name. You gave us power and the keys to do the same. Now we proclaim in Jesus. Crush the darkness we believe in Lord made a fool of death and grave Oh King Jesus You make royals out of place and now there's breakthrough Yes there is Now there's freedom in your name You gave us power
Hey Church on Fire family, my name's Gabriel and I'm the youth pastor here at Church on Fire. I'm Caleb and I'm the young adult pastor here. And so if you guys are new here, we would love to connect with you. And the easy way to do that is to text the word CONNECT to 513-268-0756 so you can stay up to date with all we're doing at Church on Fire. Yeah, and if you have any other questions, how do I give, how do I join a small group, how do I get connected more, download the Church Center app. That's where everything is for you to get connected here at the church, community, giving, all of that. So that's your one-stop shop, the Church Center app. So make sure you download that. And church, we're going to continue worshiping right now. We thank you, God. We thank you that you're our champion, that you surpass all rivals, Jesus. We thank you, God, that our confidence is in you, that it's not in our ability, God, but it's in you and who you are. Champion. 
you're facing, what wall is in front of you, what report you got from the doctor. But Jesus is bigger and he has conquered it all. And even if we don't see it right now, he's already done it and he's already won. If it's not here for today, it's for eternity. So I want to challenge you to open your mouth, to sing, to say his name, to praise him anyway, to praise him through it because he's good and he is faithful and he has already won. Come on, sing this with me. Lift your voice this morning. And when I lift my voice and shout, every wall comes crashing down. I have the authority. stop I don't know what would happen but I know that if an officer walked out into that street and put their hand up like this all traffic would stop would it not the king of kings died on the cross so that he could live inside of us that means all all caps all authority is dwelling inside of you the second that you say father jesus i say that you are king of my life and so here's what i want to ask you to do right now i don't know what you walked in here with but i'm telling you when i dealt with anxiety and fear i will tell you what changed it for me this is what changed it for me is when i learned how to take every thought captive and when i learned that all authority is living inside of me so I don't know whatever it is that you're going through. You're going through something. If you're in here, you're either going through something or you're getting ready to. I mean, I hate to say it like that, but that's, does this keep going in and out? Just, okay. I, I'm just, please. I, I feel like I want you to grasp this. So what I'm asking you to do is close your eyes and put your hands out. And I want you to say something out loud. Jesus, I receive all authority that you have placed inside of me, I receive it, Jesus. Come on, open your mouth. 
Open your mouth and fight for whatever it is that the enemy is trying to bring against you because I'm gonna tell you right now, I cancel every assignment. I cancel every assignment over every single person that the enemy is trying to bring against every person in this room, specifically anxiety, depression, fear. In the name of Jesus, now open your mouth take authority and tell him he has to go like you're standing in that street and a car's coming at you and you're saying stop in the name of Jesus stop in the name of Jesus I command you enemy that you have to stop you have no authority we are covered by your precious blood we have all authority in Jesus name proclaim it receive it sing that part again that we have authority and I want you to sing and open your mouth and declare whatever it is that you're going through, that it has to stop now, now, in the name of Jesus, by all authority given to me, by the name of Jesus Christ, I command you that you have got to stop. Can we lift Jesus up in this place? We thank you, we thank you, we thank you, Jesus. Come on, tell him thank you. Hallelujah to your name, Jesus. We are so grateful, God, that you would come, that you would be with us.
so we could know you, so we could walk in freedom, so we could make you known, Jesus, you overcame it all. And we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb has overcome, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb has overcome, we sing hallelujah. service. Uh, we've been doing it for a few months now. We just have been calling it the declaration. Pastor Doug likens it to uh, the creeds from church history. Uh, every age, it seems like the devil and his, his minions cook up some new scheme against the church, against truth, against what the Bible really says, against what the people of God should really build their lives on. And every age, the church is answered by firmly stating what it is that they believe. Pastor Doug's mentioned this is not uh, an all-encompassing statement, but these are the truths that we are holding on to right now, that we know the Bible outlays for us. Not that we are against anyone or any community, but that we know where our foundation lies, and we will not build anything on top of anything else. So this is the declaration, and if you would, would you just say this out loud with me? We believe in God the Father and in Jesus Christ, His only Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection brings us life and the forgiveness of sins. We believe that the Bible is the infallible Word of God. We believe in the biblical outlines of marriage and gender. We believe in the sanctity of all life regardless of race or nationality beginning at the moment of conception and ending at death. We will do anything short of sin to see people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we love people. Amen, amen. 
and go ahead and high five some people and turn your attention to the screen, please. I'm Justin. I am the O C F M R official Church on Fire referee. Got to warm up the juices. I back away from the referee, sir. Are you in a group? Mine is. Have you been? You in a group, sir? Nope. You're not in a group? Nope. You know what's happening now. <laughs> I was in that bad boy. I was good. Yeah, okay. I was just making sure. Okay, because you're going to throw the flag. Yes, I was going to throw a flag on you. Was it like, like uh, it was off, personal foul, foul. B-Rad, not being in a group. Oh, for sure. 10-yard penalty, first down. I'm in a group. Okay. Personal foul, unnecessary cuteness. My wife, 10-yard penalty, first down. It's in a group. I am. Yes. You are? You are? Yes. All right. Making sure we're having a clean group game here today. Are you boys in a group? Are you in a small group? I think we are. Are you in a small group? I'm pretty sure. Think. Thinking and knowing are two different things. Well, Owen's on. Tired. <laughs> hey. Are you in a small group? Yes. Or do you lead a small group or are you yes. in a small group? Yes. Because leading and being in one are two different things. <laughs> Pastor <leading>. Doug. <laughs> Are you in a small group? No. Nope. Oh. <laughs> Unnecessary height. Ten yard penalty. First down. Join a group. I know, but you're too tall. Unfair advantage. No, no, don't touch the ref. Don't touch the ref. Don't touch the ref. Don't touch the ref. You're on. Your tummy's hungry. Come on, too. Are you in a small group? Yeah. Are you sure? Did you sign up yourself or no? <laughs> Took too long to answer. Personal foul, LT, unnecessary biceps, 10 yard penalty, first down. Everyone, don't put a penalty on your life. Join a group. We have multiple categories. We have common interest groups, men and women's, men and women's groups, young adult groups, adult groups, and dinner groups. So if you're hungry, get with some people, talk about God and eat some good food. Simple. I think that if you're trying to go to the day by day on your own, it's going to be a lot harder than when you're with people. Strength in numbers equals people that you can talk to when you're going through hard things or just people to get together and have a good time with. Life's not fun when you're by yourself. Join a group. I uh, didn't know before that video, today is groups launch, okay? Awesome. Yes, we're clapping. If you're going to clap, that's wonderful. Everybody claps in a group. Everybody didn't clap. It's feeling convicted right now. I understand. So groups launches today. I know that there are some of you have been in groups that have been going on for a long time, but some of you guys have been waiting and wondering and, and trying to figure out if this whole groups thing is for you or if you really wanted to take that next step. Let today be the deciding day. We have multiple ways to sign up. I'll cover that a little later, but today is a perfect time to join a group because groups are starting out. You won't be missing anything. Uh, you're not going to be jumping into some group that's been meeting for years and years. We have all these inside jokes and you feel left out. It's a wonderful time to join a group. So if you've been on the fence, get off of it, all right? It's time to get involved. So boot camp classes start tomorrow. So these boot camp classes, we're just calling them cohorts. Uh, there are five of them, and they're listed on the screen. They're all incredible. They all fit a different need in the life of the believer. And this is our best effort, and we're developing, and we're, we're learning, and we're growing together about getting in together into a deeper process of discipleship, a deeper process of refining one another, about turning Sundays into the rest of the days of the week and turning our faith into action in our lives. So if you're not free on Monday nights, Get free on Monday nights. If you need me to call someone for you or fake a doctor's note, I will do that, okay? So Monday nights, uh, let it go ahead. Please, it started at 6.30, doors open. The classes start at 7. You'll be out the door by 8.30 in plenty of time for Monday night football and all of the wonderful things you have planned. So get to those. Sign up at mycfm.info for those. Those are just called boot camp discipleship classes. So look for those there. Then we have our most men's event coming up on September 23rd. For all the information on that and to sign up, you can go to mycfm.info. That's going to be a powerful 
time for men from all over the tri-state. There are men from multiple churches, from all over the area coming. It's not just for us, but it is for us to come in, be empowered, be uh, nudged, not quite gently, in the right direction as men of God, and it is going to be moving. So do not miss that, September 23rd. Uh, you can sign up at mycfm.info, and there's more information there as well. Then uh, we have a video to watch, but before we watch this next video, which is not quite as funny, but definitely as important as the last one, I just want to give a special shout out to Sue and Terry Thurston, who are here, the missionaries. We love them. Can we just thank them for coming? We honor them. They are on the front lines. They are doing the Lord's work, bringing the gospel all over the place. So it's an honor to have them in our midst. So we watch one more video, and then we'll get into the message, all right? Turn your attention to the screens, please. So if we keep saying things like, check out our app or mycfm.info, and you're going, I don't know what, that's what it is. Church Center is our one-stop shop for everything at Church on Fire. You can sign up, you can find groups, you can look at events that we're having, you can even pay your tithes, and, and, and thank you for being generous in your tithes and offerings, Church. We are doing uh, so many things, I can't even list them all, uh, in this building because you're being faithful and obedient in your tithes and offerings. My wife and I pay through that app. It comes out of our account reoccurring. So that app is our one-stop shop for everything Church on Fire. So go ahead and download that app uh, and stay up to date. It is a wonderful thing, and I don't love technology, but I love when it does stuff like that. So it's awesome. We, again, are launching groups, and these last two weeks we've just called them Huddle Up, making your team more than a fantasy because uh, some of us in here, we need some people on our team. We need some people in our life. We need some te- people in the li- time and the season that we live in. We need our teams to be more than just fantasies. So uh, you can open your Bibles to Romans 8. We're going to be in verses 3 through 7. And as you guys do that, I am going to pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to meet in this place. Lord, I'm even reminded this is not something to take for granted. The, the gathering of the believers, not forsaking these moments of worship, of, of being refined by your word and by your spirit coming and dwelling amongst us and highlighting things in our life. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be good soil, that the seeds that you sow would take deep root in our hearts and bear fruit in our lives, that we would have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive what it is that you want to say this morning. And let this word be a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Let us be doers of this word and not just hearers only, that we might not walk in deception. Let us leave this place different than we came in. Lord, we love you and we bless you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. 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 As many of you guys are aware, it feels almost silly to say out loud, but this is the first official day when all the NFL teams will get in the game, okay? One game started Thursday, but it's NFL kickoff Sunday, so it's exciting. People are clapping. That's great. Okay, we can just do a polite golf clap for that, okay? Not louder than you did for Jesus. Watch it. All right? So uh, I'm not going to quench the spirit, but I did feel like the Lord said, keep your message short, all right? So you'll get out of here in enough time. I'm just kidding. Uh, (laughs) Lately, it's been exciting, guys. Um, You see this shirt on? I don't just wear shirts like this for anything, okay? It's been exciting to be a Bengals fan. And I know you've probably heard it over and over again, but I'm 30, you know, I'm I'm in my 30s, 30, about to be 34, I think. I'm 33. I keep forgetting, but that doesn't matter. Uh, I am so excited to finally have something to root for on Sundays. It was like turning on the television to watch a boxing match that I was going to get beaten up with almost every year for decades, but not anymore. Joe Burrow just became the highest paid player in NFL history. Somebody said he better win the Super Bowl for all the money they're paying. I'm just happy that we're not losers anymore, okay? But it's exciting, and in the excitement, I kind of got caught up last year. I did something I promised myself I would never do. I joined a fantasy football league. Last year was the first league I ever did it. Somebody's clapping for fantasy football. Praise the Lord, I guess. 
But uh, my wife and I, we both joined it. We started kind of a fun, lighthearted group with all the youth leaders because we were over high school ministry at the time last year. So all the youth leaders got involved, and we picked these teams. And it was just a lighthearted way to make Sundays a little bit more exciting. And it, it turned into kind of a fun thing. We, we enjoyed ourselves. And in my first ever time, uh, first ever League of Fantasy, I came in second. That was exciting. I was pretty excited. My wife did come in first, though. So it was a little bit... <laughs> It was, I was tempered. My excitement was not quite tempered because every year when they went, how'd you do? I went, I came in second. Samantha from the other room would yell, but I came in first. So just, you know, pray for her pride. Uh, but we got hooked. Uh, we enjoyed it. So this year we kind of uh, made, took the initiative. We, we started a league with her family. And then before I knew it, I was involved in three other leagues with f- over 40 players that I'm keeping track of. And I looked at her on Wednesday night and just kind of went, what did I get myself into? We were laughing, and I was like, hey, I was honest that we were joking and laughing, but I was being serious. Make sure I don't get, spend too much time on this, because this could turn into a problem for me. Uh, I, I tend to fixate on things that do not matter. So I, I just said, Samantha, please make sure that this doesn't become an issue for me. This could get out of hand. And I'm not sure, I, I don't know where you're at. Now, fantasy sports, you know, you could care less. Some of you, you probably didn't even know it was NFL kickoff Sunday. You're going, oh, my goodness, people are wearing jerseys. What's that for? Uh, so depending on where you're at on the spectrum, or whether you love sports, or whether you don't care about sports, whether you, you play fantasy football, or you think I'm sinning, uh, what we all need to know, what we all need to do in this room, we need to get our priorities straight. We need to get our priorities straight. We have to get our priorities straight because growing up or even now, you know, you could have posters of people or you follow pages or you're invested in reading articles about things and about people that have no idea that you even exist on this planet. And we spend time and effort and mental energy on things. Some of us know more about the characters of the office TV show than we do about the people in our own office. Some of us know more about the Cincinnati Bengals roster and whether or not a player's playing or a fantasy football roster than we do about the roster of friends our children have. Time is precious, but it's also slippery. And we have to prioritize. Look at what Romans 8, 3 through 7 says. It says, The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. There is a battle being waged inside of us. A battle that will be constant. Not a battle for our salvation. Jesus won that battle on the cross. But there is a battle against our sinful nature and what Romans explains here. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Thank you, Jesus. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied. That means the law, the the debt we have, is satisfied. Who no longer, the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. So we're not supposed to follow our sinful nature. It didn't say there is no sinful nature. It said do not follow the sinful nature, follow the Spirit. In verse 5, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. Nikki got up and shared a powerful word from the Lord about being attuned to who God is and what authority we possess when he lives inside of us. That's the Holy Spirit. That's giving ourselves, giving our minds, giving our thoughts to the Holy Spirit. Some of us, our anxiety and our depression is as simple, not as easy, but as simple as stopping our minds from following our sinful nature and fixing our minds on the Spirit that brings life and peace. That's what Romans says. So how do we overcome this innate sinful nature? How do we defeat the constant magnetism towards our flesh? How do we empower ourselves to let the Spirit control our minds? Point number one, prioritize your life. Prioritize your life. You might think this is a little pragmatic or a little too simple, not quite mystical or spiritual enough, but just bear with me. I'll use myself as an example for prioritizing my life. I confessed my sin to you earlier that I am 
and now the fantasy football manager of three teams and over 40 players, okay? So let's say, for argument's sake, that I spend 20 minutes per week on each of these three teams. I'm adjusting the roster. I'm checking points. I'm trash talking because my team's winning. I'm doing all the things, you know, adjusting all the stuff and spending 20 minutes on each team. That's three times 20 is 60 minutes a week. That would be one hour per week that I spend on this. So uh, my priorities in my life are, and the top three, I could say pretty confidently, are uh, being absolutely, completely, undisputedly in love with and obedient to God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. That's number one. Number two would be uh, loving my wife like Christ loved the church and leading her deeper into a relationship with Jesus and, and covering her and protecting her. Number three would be loving my children wholeheartedly as God the Father has loved me, so I will love them and I will show them a, a fulfilling and fruitful life so that they themselves will adopt a fulfilling and fruitful life with Jesus. Those are my priorities, my top priorities, and everything else is so far down the list it's almost not even there. I mean, friends and, and things are, are there, but those are my top three priorities. And you'll notice that fantasy football did not make the list of priorities. But if I spend an hour a week on fantasy football, adjusting my roster, doing harmless, innocuous stuff, and if I spend an hour goofing around doing that, but I don't spend far more than an hour loving my wife, and far more than an hour loving my children and playing with them and showing that they have a present, attached, invested father, and far more than an hour binding up my sinful nature and my laziness and pouring my heart out in intimacy with love for God and growing closer with Him, if I don't spend more than an hour doing those things, no matter what I think or say, no matter what I tell other people, the way I spend my time shows everyone that fantasy football is more important to me. And, and it's silly, you're thinking, wow, this is a silly, it's not silly to some people. Because if you cataloged how you spend your week and the things you spend your times doing, and then you lined up your priorities, I wonder how they would line up. And again, your interests might have nothing to do with sports at all. Maybe you unwind by watching television at night. Maybe you go for walks or you work out and you're really into fitness. And so you watch what you eat. And you're, or maybe you're kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum and you love making delicious meals and going out to delicious restaurants and enjoying yourself and finding new places to eat. However you spend your time, listen, how you spend your time shows what your priorities are. I was having a conversation with somebody who's a friend of mine, and they were saying, so what do you, what do, you do now? How do you spend your time? And I, you know, I, I said, well, I, I get time in with the Lord. I, Samantha and I are just hanging out a lot and enjoying time as our daughters are getting older. They're requiring less 24-hour attention, so we get to talk more, play with the girls. And they're like, well, what, but what do you spend your time on? And I was like, well, I, I, you know, I read books about the Lord and, and about growing in my faith. I, I you know, spend time with Samantha. I, I, I hang out with my daughters, and they love to wrestle and play, so I wrestle and play with them. We have this little game, the mini game, where we, we do this thing, and they're like, but what do you spend time doing? I was like, you, that's what I spend my time on. That's what's important to me. They were, I think they were waiting for me to say, like, I'm a woodworker, or like something, like, but that's what's important to me. How you spend your time shows what your priorities are. And we need to constantly take inventory of our lives and reprioritize. And this may sound simple to you, but the most fruitful things in life are often the simplest. Make God your number one priority. Make God your number one priority. If he's not there, the list is whack from there on out. Make God your number one priority. And I'll give you an example of how it causes problems when time and priorities aren't lined up. Some of you... Uh, this will be a freebie. This is a freebie for all the couples, especially the men, because we struggle with this the most. So you're welcome. This is free. It's not even a sermon on marriage or relationships. But you're going to run into immense relational tension when what you say your priorities are don't line up with what you spend your time and energy on. Some of you, you go home and you think, oh, I have such a nagging wife or a girlfriend that won't leave me alone. Or maybe the roles are reversed. Maybe you think, wow, I've got a really distant husband who never wants to do anything with me or a distant boyfriend, it could be that your priorities are whack. Your priorities aren't right. Because when you say God and family are the most important things, but you don't devote any time to them, or you're not invested in them, or you're not showing them the time of day, or when you walk in the door, you act like 
you are gone or detached and nobody can talk with you. Or when your spouse walks in the door, you treat them angry because they've been gone all day, but they've been gone because they're working and you need to work to have that. So it's just a little bit awkward when our priorities don't align with the things that we spend our time and energy on. So we wonder why our our spouse is distant. We wonder why our children don't trust us. It's because we're living a double life. The things we say are important are not the things we're showing people are important. And we wonder why as Christians the world stopped listening to us long ago about this gospel, the most important thing that we have to say, maybe because we've been saying too many other things. So we say God and family are the most important things. Let's get our priorities straight. I chuckled when I read this. This is a true story. The famous British actor Michael Caine uh, was asked by an interviewer what his thoughts were about starring in the fourth Jaws movie, which, yes, there were four, Jaws the Revenge. So Michael Caine told the interviewer he loved working on the movie. I loved working on the movie, he said. The interviewer was shocked and surprised by his answer and continued the questioning. They said this movie was heavily criticized. It was a box office flop. Special effects were horrible. And your role, your portrayal of that character was by many critics considered awful, one of the worst of your career. What on earth did you like about the movie? What a nice interviewer. Michael Caine chuckled and smiled as he answered, I have never seen the movie, but you're right. By all accounts, I've heard that it was actually terrible. He said, I've never seen the movie, but you're right. By all accounts, I've heard that it was actually terrible. I have seen the house that it built, and it is terrific. That's priorities. I don't care what people think of me. I don't care how they appraise my performance. I don't care what the critics say. I care about providing for the people and loving the people and doing my job as the man of my house and and being obedient to God. I'm prioritizing. And I think he had his priorities right when he said that, which is quite funny. I, I don't care about the movie. I care about the house that it built. I love that which is wonderful. We have to get our priorities right. So how do you build a fail-safe method into your life that helps you keep your priorities straight? Point number two, get around other people with the same priorities. Get around other people with the same priorities. So when you make God your number one priority and give your life to him, things need to change. And one of the first changes we have to make on this journey is recognizing who our new family actually is. And we're going to read in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. It says, For you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. It's saying in 26 and 27, When you say yes to Christ... You are adopted into God's family. Your identity is changed. And he's saying you put on Christ like putting on new clothes so that when God looks at you, he doesn't see the old sinful nature. He sees what the Bible says in another place, the righteousness of Christ. So we're not the same. We're completely different. Everything has changed. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It's not making a commentary on gender, don't worry. What it's saying is everything that used to separate you and divide you, everything that used to uh, remove you from unity has been washed over because you're all in one family. And now that you all belong to Christ, you are all the true children of Abraham. He's saying we're all belonging to Christ. We are all in one family. You are his heirs, and God's promise belongs to you. God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. So again, when you make God your number one priority, and you put your faith in him, and you give your life to him, you become God's child. It says like putting on new clothes. We all got our jerseys on. We've all repping our teams. We all are showing off who who we support, who we root for, kind of whose we are in our fandom. So it doesn't matter what the Bible, the Bible's saying it doesn't matter about your nationality, your race, your socioeconomic position. None of those things matter anymore because we're all on the same team. We're all in the same family. But sometimes we miss an important step in our spiritual journey. We come to Christ, we take our adoption seriously, we get baptized, we say yes to Jesus, we believe we're a child of God. But when you say yes to Jesus and you don't really join the family, normally one of two things happen. The first one is that we say yes to Jesus, but we don't find new friends and spiritual family, and then we go back to our old friends. And when we go back to our old friends, eventually our, our old friends pull us back into our old habits, 
and our old habits pull us back into our old life. And then eventually we start to think this whole Jesus thing was really just a creation of our minds anyway, and it wasn't ever really real, just some feeling that I had, and we distance ourselves from our faith. And, and we can't do that. that. That's not how it works. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32 and 33 says, If there is no resurrection, let's feast and drink. Paul's quoting uh, an Old Testament uh, passage. He says, don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. Saying, if nothing matters, let's feast and drink, for tomorrow we die, it says. And he says, don't be fooled by people who say such things. Bad company corrupts good character. And you may have heard that verse before, but don't think that you have spiritually matured past the place of bad company corrupting good character. You can minister, you can love, you can spend time around, you can maintain relationship with, but if you are spending more time around bad company than you are around good company, it will corrupt your character. And it will lead you back down the path that you got saved from in the first place. Or number two might happen. We say yes to Jesus and cut ourselves off from our old friends and we get isolated and lonely. So we think, I'm never going back. There is, I am going to cut off every chance. We send text messages, we make phone calls, we block numbers. We say, I'm never going back there again. And that's great, but in our effort to never go back, we cut ourselves off from ever moving forward. And we think, you know, uh, we live in a society when we're more attached to one another through social media and through uh, instant messaging and all these different things that we can do and messaging and iMessage. You can send all kinds of funny memes and everything to anybody and comment on whatever. But if we took us an anonymous survey of the room right now, I bet one of the most prevalent feelings in the room would be loneliness and isolation. I feel alone. I'm, I've been married for however many years. I feel, I, I've had a best friend. They don't even know what's really I'm struggling with. I'm alone. I'm surrounded, I'm in a room full of people and you might feel alone right now. So now we're cut off, we're isolated and we become easy prey for continual attack. And the devil might not get you on the first pass or the second pass, but please hear this and write this down. No matter how strong you are, fighting alone means you won't be fighting for long. You cannot isolate yourself. In our efforts to detach ourselves from our old sinful nature, we never attach ourselves to anything new. And then we just get attacked and attacked and attacked and attacked. And if you're fighting alone, that means you won't be fighting for long. So please, 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 let's get around people who share the same priorities. And I'm going to share something with you that will probably help you on your journey of fitting into your new family. Okay? This is probably the, the crucial part of my message that I want you to understand. So please, if you're taking pictures or you're writing, taking notes, write this down in all caps, underline it, text it to yourself so you don't forget. The deciding factor in determining your friendships should be your priorities, not your preferences. The deciding factor in determining your friendships should be your priorities, not your preferences. I'll explain it a little bit. From a very young age, we're taught, right? We're, we're grouped together by our age. Then we're separated into our, our, how you know, smart we are in a certain class or a certain uh, affinity for a topic. And then we're sorted into the things we like to do with our spare time. And then we're kind of brought up. And as we get older, we're around people who like the same music or who want to spend their time doing the same things. Or, and we're kind of sorted and herded into these categories. And, and then we kind of become familiar with the people in those categories. And then as we grow up and get older, we live in the same area with the same kind of people. And we, we share the same career. Or we share the same hobby. And those people become our friends. And there's nothing in inherently wrong about that. It's not wrong to have common interests. It's easier to make friends when you have things in common. Nobody's arguing that. And I think it's silly if somebody says, forget all those things. But, but that's not the priority. The moment we get our priorities right and make God number one and join his family and get on his team, things have changed and sometimes we don't really register the change. We come to church we get involved in a group or we join a team and, and we start to talk to people and we kind of go, I am not really fitting in with them. They, they don't come from the same place I come from. They don't have the same humor I have. They don't, our personalities don't mesh. So we, we, we detach from that. And maybe we even join another team or another group, and, but it's the same kind of thing there. We just don't have anything in common. So we detach again. And after a while, we start to think, well, I just don't fit in here. I'll just, I'll just come on Sundays or I'm going to go and find another place and, and where I fit in more. And, and it's good fit in but prioritize what fits and what matters. Because, you know, I, I will say this. If you're in God's family, if God is your number one priority, 
then you have more in common with the people in this room and on these teams and on these small groups than anyone else in the world. Right, if you can, we can clap for that if you would like to clap. And you might be confused by that. Matt, how do I have more in common with a room full of strangers? How do I have more in common watching online? How do I possibly have more in common? They're not like me. They look different. They don't come from the same places. We're at different stages of life. You might even be physically a different age or spiritually a different age and level of maturity. And you think, well, I just, I, how can I have more in common with those people? Let me, let me help you by showing you an example, okay? Caleb and Gabe, would you guys mind coming up? Wonderful. This, the Lord ordained decades ago. This illustration has been planned by God for years. Okay? Uh, Gabe, you stay there. Caleb, will you stand over here, actually? All right, don't crowd me, though, all right? You're making me uncomfortable. I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, so, as you can see, with your working eyes, Gabe is a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Hold it. Chill out, all right? Caleb is a Michigan Wolverines fan. Again, Silence, please. So you might be wondering, and I'm going to say this publicly, documented, these are two of my closest friends, even though Gabe is a Pittsburgh Steelers fan and Caleb is a Michigan Wolverines fan. You might be wondering, Matt, how could you throw your lot in with such, I can't even say the words, <laughs> with these horrible people. You, you must question their taste, Matt. How would you ever trust them with your friendship? Clearly they're demented. And you're right, they are. But remember, the determining and deciding factor in determining our friendships should be your priorities and not your preferences. So, although Gabe is a Steelers fan and Caleb is a Wolverines fan, I've seen the way that they love God and they serve him. And I've seen the way that they love their wives and they lay their lives down and sacrifice their own wants and needs to help their helpmate, their wife. And I've seen the way that they're willing to be fathers to their children and serve their God and go hard and, 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 and spend long time fighting for people. And so even though Gabe's a Steelers fan and Caleb's a Michigan Wolverines fan, they are my friends because it's priorities and not preferences. Do we understand this? So when things go wrong with Gabe, I don't look at him and go, ugh, you're gross. I go, you know what, Gabe? I'm cheering for you. Go Steelers! Go Steelers! Amen. Somebody gave me this towel, and they were legitimately scared of what I was going to do with it. They were like, "What? It, promise me. Look me in the eyes. I'm going to get this back. You're not going to do anything with it. You're not going to blow your nose. And I, it's in good hands, all right? Because I care more about my priorities and our priorities than our preferences. And when Michigan does well, and they're in the final four of college sports, I'm going, go blue. Go blue. Go blue. I'm an Ohio State fan, but I care more about our priorities, our friendship, because it doesn't matter what we've got in common, because our most common thing matters. Yeah. So you guys, thank you so much for, yeah. Some of us need to awaken to the fact that old friends might not be fit to take us to new places. And I'm not talking bad about anybody in our lives. I've got old friends, and I love my old friends. But the people God is trying to surround you with aren't necessarily the ones you'd pick for yourself. But that's not an accident. You picked them the first time and it didn't go that well for you. So maybe let God have a hand in it this time because priorities matter. Preferences don't. And yes, you'll find common interest in things. But the, mo the closest friends I have in my life and the closest friends I've made since I started following the Lord, sometimes we'll look at one another and go, how are we friends? I don't like any of the things you like. You're this way, I'm that way. You're, you like that thing, I like this thing. And, and how are we friends? And then we look at each other and we remember. We're not just friends, we're warriors together with the Lord. We're fighting for a common cause. We're laying our lives down for a common thing. And then suddenly all those preferences, they don't matter that much because our priorities are so closely aligned. We've been knit together like brothers. That's what happens when you prioritize your friendships based on priorities and not preferences. So how should I be around people who share my priorities, Matt? I bet you knew what point number three is going to be. Join a group. <laughs> Join a group. And yes, yes, you're right. You're wondering, Matt, this whole sermon has been one long con to get me in a group, hasn't it? Absolutely it has. <laughs> Shamelessly, get in a group. If you're fighting alone, you will not be fighting for long. 
And maybe you think, well, I've got my people. You know, they don't really love the Lord. Our priorities don't align, but they've been with me for decades. Or I don't really want to open up. I've been hurt before. I've got trust issues. It sounds like you need some people in your life who love you unconditionally. It sounds like you might need some people whose priorities align with one another. It sounds like you might need to give it some time to find a group that you, you sit on and you get in. And those people cover you and love you and protect you. And it might not be the first group or the second group. I've, I've told you before, my wife and I have tried a couple different groups before we found the group that it wasn't about preferences, it was about priorities and our schedules aligned and, and, and it happened. We were covered and protected and we covered and protected others. And it, it helped us immensely because we prioritized what mattered and we got in a group. So maybe you're already in a group. Maybe you're sitting here and you're polishing your halo and you're going, I'm perfect, leave me alone. Great, awesome, you can preach next week. But this week... Let me talk to people who need to join a group, okay? Join a group. You might not notice it every day. You might not feel like it every day. But if you get any sort of invested in this faith and really take it seriously, you will notice we are in a fight. We are in a nonstop, no holds bar, full throttle fight to the death for our very souls. I need some people who are going to fight with me, not fight against me. Fight alongside me. Fight for me. I heard this true story. It's, it's crazy. And obviously December 7th, 1941 was a horrible day in our nation's history. It was the day uh, the Japanese Empire sent bombers to attack Pearl Harbor. And they caught us surprised and, and devastated. It was part of our Navy that was there. Thankfully, some was out doing some drills. But uh, many lives were lost. It was a huge shock to our country and our nation. You might remember that it spurred the United States to abandon their pretty tightly held commitment to neutrality. It pushed us into the war, and not only into the war, but the strength of American military and the American industry actually turned the tide for the Allies' power, and we ended up, three years later, the war ended, thanks to that push that got us in. But, I, but before we got into the war, something really, really important happened, something that showed what happens in a real fight. Just 10 hours after the news broke that the attack had happened, as government officials and U.S. military uh, officials were meeting together and, and gathering and flying from all over to their headquarters, a telegram came in from across the Atlantic from Winston Churchill, the then uh, Prime Minister of England. It said, In lieu of the attack on our youngest and most vibrant ally, the United Kingdom has formally declared war on the Empire of Japan. Sincerely, Winston Churchill. Nine hours later, the United States themselves would follow suit and declare war on Japan and the rest of the Axis powers. And then, you know, obviously we go on to help turn the tide of that war and fight together with the Allied powers. But don't miss what happened. When we were attacked, when we had been uh, caught out, completely unsurprised and unprepared, when the smoke was still burning from the fires and the debris was still littered in the harbor and on the docks, our allies were ready to fight for us. Before we even declared war ourselves, our allies were ready to fight with us, alongside us, to go all in, to be there in our time of need. We need some people who are ready. We need some people like that in our lives. We need some people who are gonna fight. And it's not just your spouse, it's not just your one friend. You know, you've heard the old adage, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to love Jesus in this day and age. Find your people, find your village, find your fighters, join a group, join a group. And I'm gonna be very pragmatic, very practical for the next few moments. You can join a group by downloading the app and going to the groups tab at the bottom of the page. You can join a group by going out into the lobby after service and using the phone, the camera, on your phone to scan one of the QR codes and look at what groups they have. You can join a group by going to our website, clicking the groups tab and finding one. They all lead to the same place. You're not gonna get different options or some secret menu of groups. They all lead to the same place. Join a group, find your fighters, find the people who are gonna help you. Find the people who are gonna stand with you and link arms with you. Before we leave and, and cheer on the Bengals, and our Steelers, and the Colts, and the Michigan Wolverines, whoever. Before we leave, just want to make sure we've got our priorities straight. We started at the beginning by saying you should make God your number one priority. 
I'm going to read Romans 8 again. Verse 3 through 4. It says, The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. That means no matter how moral you are, no matter how good you are, no matter what rules you keep, no matter how often you open the Bible and you read the Ten Commandments and you, you say that I'm a good person or you try to do good things or you try to earn things, your sinful nature will always let you down. So God did what the law could not do, what morality could not do, what our own striving for good could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. That means he who was without sin became sin. Jesus put on flesh. Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus who spoke existence into being came to this earth as a baby and bore our sin. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. That means that sin does not control us when we say yes to Jesus and acknowledge his sacrifice for us. Thank you, Jesus. He did this so that the just requirement of the law could be fully satisfied, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. Some of you, you maybe have already given your life to the Lord. I'm gonna give an opportunity for anybody who, who wants to make God their number one priority, who wants to say yes to accepting Jesus. But that right there, I wanna, I wanna highlight for some of us in here who are following Jesus, I need you to understand. He did this, it says. God did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. That means it's over. You who think God is mad at you, you who think God is waiting for you to clean up your act, you who are waiting to get in a group until you've matured past a certain point, you who are waiting for God to finally uh, feel, or for it to finally feel like God really loves you, it's fully satisfied. It's paid for. It's done. When God looks at you, remember, like putting on new clothes, he sees Jesus. Stop acting like you're still filthy when Jesus cleaned you up. Stop thinking of yourself that way. Stop believing those things. Stop letting your mind take you in that sinful nature and control you. But some of us in here, we need to get it right right now. So would you guys just bow your heads right now. If you're sitting in this room and you're going, I need to make God the number one priority in my life. I need to say yes to Jesus. I need to put on Christ and let his perfection cover my inadequacy. I need to be washed clean and set free. If that's you right now, would you just raise your hand in the air? Amen. 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 You guys can put your hands down. Guys, would you stand to your feet with me this morning? We're going to say a prayer for a moment. Or in a moment, pardon me. Simple as ABC. And, and we say, we admit, right, A, we admit that Jesus came to this earth. We admit we need Jesus. We admit our need for his coming. We, and B, we believe that he did it. We believe that the Bible is true. We believe all the things that it says. And C, we confess our sins. And the Bible, in a mystery that will take eternity to unravel, says that when we confess our sins to God, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So when we say we're sorry to God and confess our sins, he forgives us of our sins with no sort of payment, no sort of waiting. He just does it. And then D, we want to go and be doers of the word. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. The mark of the loving follower of Jesus is what you do, not just what you say. So it's as simple as that. And we're going to say that prayer together. So would you, would you say it with me? Say, Jesus, I admit I need you. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you came to this earth. You lived a perfect life. You died on the cross. You rose again, and you did it for me. Thank you, Jesus. Say, Jesus, I've sinned. I'm sorry for my sin. I confess my sin. Please forgive me. Now say this. I am forgiven. My debt is fully satisfied. Thank you, Jesus. Say, Holy Spirit, come into my heart. Fill my life. Give me strength and courage to go out and do what you say. Now let's end this way. Say, I am a child of God. 
I am born again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we clap for everybody who just gave their lives to Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. So before I, I pray and bless you guys on behalf of Pastor Doug and Karen, uh, I just want to remind you, sign up for a group. If you gave your life, raise your hand or made a decision in your heart, please go to the Jesus Wall. We have a path for you. It will make it as simple as possible to start this journey and succeed on this journey together. So please go to the Jesus Wall. We're going to have prayer team come on up right now. If you need prayer for anything or you want to come up and, and, and seek some counsel or a prayer, we would love to pray with you. Some of the most powerful moments of my life have been at altars just like this one, getting prayer by people just like these people. So don't be shy. But go out, check out Being a Group. We're actually going to start a new series next week called A Funeral for Western Christianity. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I'm excited for it. A Funeral for Western Christianity. Uh, times are changing. And I think the church is as well. So we'll talk more about that next week. So would you guys just bow your heads, put your hands out as I pray on behalf of Pastor Doug and bless you. Lord, thank you for all the men and women in this room. And thank you for the young people in this room and the students and uh, the young kids back in, in elementary, preschool, nursery. Thank you, God, for everyone watching online and joining us uh, digitally. God, we ask that you would bless us. We ask that you would be with us as we leave this place. Holy Spirit, that we would go with courage, that we would take new steps, not for comfort, but for growth, God, that you would empower us and be with us, that the seeds, again, take deep root in our hearts and bear fruit in our lives. Lord, give all the marriages in here supernatural unity and patience and joy. Let their homes be places of laughter, oases of rest and joy. Let their families be nourished. Let their children grow up in the way of the Lord so that when they're older, they will not depart from it. Cover them and be with them. Give parents wisdom and strategy. Bless the young people on their walks, God. Give them guidance. Surround them with people that will help them on their journey. And be wise counsel to them. Bless those who are single in this room or divorced or widowed. God, be with them. Cover them. Lord, comfort them and, and heal them as they, they seek out what you have for them in the season that they're in and the season to come. Now, would you look up at me as I say this? May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, lift his countenance upon you, and give you peace. And we say this with me. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a great week.